Behind me, you can see Minas Basin. That large mountain off in the distance is known as Blompton. And beside Blompton flows Minas Passage and Minas Channel out to Scotts Bay and the Bay of Fundy. The largest tides in the world occur here. On really large tides, it can go as much as almost 20 meters. That amount of tide creates an incredible current through Minas Passage and up to 10 meters per second. And of course, there's tremendous amount of power in that flow. And this is the place they want to put tidal turbines because of all that power. Tidal power, like wind energy and solar, would be a renewable form of, of energy production. And people have wanted it, but the alternate side is that uh, although it's green that way, it comes in contact, let's say, with the fish and the fisheries and the ecology of the Minas Basin. So um, there is a downside that is, that is there since this area is well known for its fisheries. It really came to a head in the late 1970s and early 80s when they decided to build or plan to build very large barrages in the upper Bay of Fundy. We began our research um, for tidal power uh, impacts on fisheries in the upper Bay of Fundy in the late 70s and early 80s uh, while they were planning to put in the big barrages. But what happened was in order to put those large barrages in, they wanted to test the turbine type. So they chose Annapolis Royal on Digby Basin to put a single turbine in the water. So when we finished our research in the upper bay, we moved to that area and began studying what would happen when you pass fish through a turbine, experimentally. When fish pass through the turbine draft tube, because of the characteristics of the turbine, first, the turbine is a big spinning propeller. So there is what we call mechanical strike taking place all the time. In other words, the fish are actually hit by the turbine machinery. However, other things happen over the blades, which is what makes them work. These, are, these turbines are called axial flow hydraulic lift, and it's the hydraulic lift that is produced that creates pressure changes inside the draft tube. Those pressure changes affect fish by disrupting their gas bladder and other aspects, or causing small pressure explosions around the blade, which also um, harm or kill the fish. And then the final thing is as the water is coming off the back end of the blade, shear takes place. And shear is a, an affects smallest fish the most, things like salmon smolts or herring, and it can literally tear their head off as they pass through the zone where two velocities of current over the blade intersect. When you look at all those aspects of mortality, um, average mortalities in virtually almost any turbine and this is in freshwater as well as tidal situations, run from about 10 to 20 percent up as high as 100 percent. There's almost no fish that can go through a turbine or a fish population uh, without having some level of mortality. The devastation by that tidal turbine, which was Nova Scotia's first tidal turbine, um, is catastrophic. Uh, one species in particular, striped bass, which was economically important to that area, brought a lot of money, a lot of business into that area, and uh, was a unique genetic strain. It's been wiped out. Um, I believe it's been two years since a single fish has been caught. Um, that fact that it's been wiped out in such a short period of time, of 27 years, I believe, um, has put the striped bass on the Kozakwik listing of uh, a species at risk because now they only have one major river to spawn in instead of having two or three. Um, that turbine has uh, caused a lot of damage. Nothing was done about it. Nothing has been done. Nothing is being done. It is still killing other species off. Um, and it set precedent in our province to how industry and government will deal with the damage caused by the so-called green energy of tidal power. As the fish get bigger, then they're more likely to mechanical strike. Basically, mechanical strike is a completely random thing that takes place and is a, a controlled by the size of the fish. The bigger the fish, the higher probability of being struck by the turbine blade. For the Annapolis Royal situation, 
what we call the water length is about 3.2 meters and when a fish is that big, i.e. somewhere around 9 to 10 feet, then strike is virtually 100 percent. The Annapolis River and the Bay of Fundy are full of Atlantic sturgeon and Atlantic sturgeon adults routinely um, reach 10 feet or more in length. So, uh, and then of course in the open Bay of Fundy there are large organisms like porpoises, uh, whales, seals, and all of these could go through a tidal turbine and be struck by the rotating blade. And of course because of their large body size they have a high probability of impact. You know, when you see the strike potentials, you see the big fish affect it mostly. So it automatically it makes you assume that little fish and microorganisms aren't. That is not true at all. A um, couple examples would be um, herring. Herring is extremely at risk because of the, uh, the, the bladder uh, potential of exploding. Um, very sensitive fish, thin walled, thin -walled uh, sides, um, great numbers. Then we go right straight down to lobster larvae. Lobster larvae is a very sensitive uh, organism. Um, it's, uh, it's got huge potential, not strike potential, which is what they show you. It's got huge potential to be exploded with the cavitation um, when it goes through. And it's, uh, there's a ton of lobster there by Nepper Bay of Fundy. It's an extremely important industry. Um, brings a huge revenue into Nova Scotia. Um, and as well as the herring does. There's a herring fishery just outside of the passage. And it's because it's there because the fish are there. When you see the numbers for uh, uh, the turbines, of the percentage of chance of death, it's a, a one event thing that they're showing you. With tidal turbines, they're extremely dangerous because multiple events happen, um, especially in the passage. The passage is used as a transit route, not a migratory route. It's also used as a migratory route, but it's used as a transit route on a daily basis. We use an example of, um, of Atlantic sturgeon. Atlantic sturgeon come up in here in uh, May. And they stay until August, as a general theory. That's what people think, and that's what we see as fishermen. Um, so these fish are high strike potentials. They're up over 50% strike potentials on the average size sturgeon in many, many studies. Um, they also live 60 years. So you have them here for four months, uh, three to four months. And uh, you have four times a day they can potentially pass that turbine. Then you times that by seven. Then you times that by 30 days in a month. Then you times that by four months, and then you can times it by 60 years. So that number that they give you is, is not correct. It may be correct for a one-day pass, but those things come up here, and they live here, they feed here, and they spend a great majority of their life here, and that passage is uh, where they come and go. When I talk about tidal turbines and, and their effects on fishes, um, I'm always, always asked, is there any way to minimize this problem? For a small tidal turbine operation like Annapolis Royal, it would be possible to some degree, but it would be very expensive. And, and they have tried to uh, alleviate some of the fish damage there by putting up what they call bangers in the, in the uh, draft tube to keep, try to keep fish out. But the problem with, with tidal power is that the flow of water is so high, it's, uh, once the fish are in the draft area, it's literally impossible to stop them. So what I'm always asked is why not put a screen across the front of the thing? And the problem with that is uh, very quickly in virtually any tidal situation or even river situation, uh, the screen gets clogged. And the screen can even be clogged by you know, a large number of fishes as well as seaweed, leaves, logs, and everything else. So there's a number of different types of tidal power proposed. The uh, standard um, barrage system like they have at Annapolis Royal is now known to cause a fair amount of, of uh, fish damage and um, so the tidal power planners, the engineers, the scientists are looking at what they call the open concept and in this case uh, you put a tidal um, turbine, usually an extremely large one, into a place like Minus Passage without building a barrage and the turbine stand on, stands on its own. Now in this situation, um, people are proposing that the fish will, and things like marine mammals will be able to avoid the turbines. And really when you look over there at uh, Blomaton, that's where those big turbines are going to go if they go in. And they are, one has been in and take, been taken out, others are being planned. Um, 
whether or not the fish will avoid them, well, that's the research that has to be done. That site in particular is extremely dangerous because of the fact it's so narrow, such high speed, and, uh, and as well there's an unseen mountain ridge on the bottom that directly funnels the fish into the foresight that I presented to them and, uh, and which is one of my major concerns with site selection. Um, next concern I have is the lack of monitoring plans. So when they put these in, um, my concern is that they're not going to be monitored. So I presented that. Um, they said that it couldn't be done. Um, I made it aware that they had cameras on their turbines to watch their blades. So I presented why cannot you put cameras out to see what dies, um, if anything dies. And uh, they said their answer was it wasn't in the budget. For me, that was uh, not acceptable. As a fisherman, I am restricted to seasons, rightfully so. Um, I'm restricted to certain quotas, rightfully so. Um, we can only run so long during the year. Only so many people can fish because there's only so much fish to fish. These things will run 24 hours a day, four cycles, two tide cycles, but one in, one out, um, in the narrowest place on the eastern seaboard, not just Nova Scotia, but the eastern seaboard with many species using this as a summer habitat and a spring spawning ground. Um, extremely uh, dangerous site. There's been a few statements been made, um, in particular by the force proponents um, of the open concept turbines. Now just by saying open concept, it, it makes you believe that, oh, okay, these fish can go around this, and in theory they can. Um, this is not an untrue statement, but it doesn't mean they will go around it. Humans have been fishing weirs in North America since 13,000 years recorded, and there's not, the fish aren't avoiding my weir. I make a living out here. So if they can't avoid my weir, why would they avoid the turbine? Um, they haven't avoided my gill nets. A big noisy trawl goes through. They still catch tons of fish in those trawls out there. The saners move in. They still catch their fish, right? These fish haven't evolved or have the mental cap capability to avoid anything. The newest player in the game is uh, Halcyon, which is a uh, proposed uh, tidal barrage the size of the Confederation Bridge in Scotts Bay with 304 turbines in it. Um, where this barrage is even far worse than the, the open concept, um, even though the, that doesn't mean that the open concept is not bad. And that's what people are starting to believe. It's not the case, but the, the closed concept is, is twice as bad, simply because what goes in must come out the same way it went in, um, which doubles the chances every event, every tide of a strike potential or death by other means. It's also a very bad location. Um, back in the narrows, not as narrow as the foresight, but it's, it's at the resting place of the fish that are coming up the coast of Nova Scotia along uh, the Digby side. And uh, on the outgoing tide, they stop and they rest in that bay um, and wait for the tide to change. So you have a, a mingling of fish in that area, that exact area. It's also a recorded, uh, known major spawning site of, of Atlantic herring, which is a huge industry in Nova Scotia. Um, brings many dollars into our province. Um, it's just, these site selections are just atrocious and they need to be... Um, they need to be a top priority, and they haven't been. The problem here, putting tidal turbines into this highly dynamic environment in the Bay of Fundy, which is also extremely productive because of that dynamics, uh, is, is, in my mind, very, um, well, I won't say impossible to do, but I would say that in many ways what's going to happen is that you'll have to give up one sustainable uh, resource, i.e. the fishery, to some extent, in order to have the other sustainable resource there, the energy production. Uh, how much of the fishery sustainable resource will be um, impacted or harmed is really what's going to be found out through the scientific testing of the various turbines. In some cases, like Scotts Bay, where they're going to put in uh, a large number of uh, Turbines in a barrage-like situation, I could say 100% right now, that's going to cause a lot of damage to fisheries. A few questions Nova, Sco Nova Scotians have to ask. First one, are we getting this power? You need to ask that of all companies. 
but we use a health center for example. I held a public meeting a month ago, and a representative was there, and I put him on the table and I asked him, because I, my, from my understanding, we, they weren't getting the power. We weren't getting that power. And he openly admitted that Nova Scotia has turned them down for that power. So now, this uh, company is going to produce power in our waters with little benefit to us, great devastation. For what? Where's Nova Scotia's benefit? Our fisheries has been around for a very long time. It's sustainable. It's thriving in my area. My catches are higher than most catches ever recorded. There's the recreational side of it. Recreational fishermen fish from one end of the basin to the other for striped bass. Um, there's a huge economic benefit to the communities. Um, corner stores, small isolated places. Um, jobs is another question we need to ask. When they say about how many jobs he's going to produce, I ask the companies the question again. How many of them are our jobs? Right? Because the turbines are being made for, for Halcyon in Quebec, so those aren't our jobs. Um, the infrastructure, I believe, is being barged up from the states. Those aren't our jobs. So exactly how many jobs are predicted for Nova Scotians? Let's get that real number. No power, few jobs, great devastation to our ecosystem. For what? to say we're the giant and tidal power, Nova Scotia, for just the stigma of having that, I don't see the benefit. 